Hi, everyone, and welcome to the second webinar in the State of IoT Connectivity webinar series by Monogoto. My name is Liran Adlin, and I'm the Senior Marketing Manager at Monogoto. The topic of this webinar is eSIM. All you wanted to know about eSIM, uh, we chose this topic because a lot of people don't know what eSIM is and confuse it with other terms. And it's a repeated question, which is apparently unclear. And we wanted to take this opportunity to clarify and explain the technology and to walk you through the world of eSIM. We have a one hour session in total when the last 15 minutes will be dedicated to questions. Our host for today is Mr. Maor Efrati. Maor is the co-founder and CTO of Monogoto. Maor has 25 years of experience in building cellular networks, clouds, and internet applications. You can, um, you can feel free to ask questions in the chat window during the webinar series session. Don't worry, in case we miss any questions, we will contact you after the webinar. Uh, and now, without further ado, I'll pass the mic to Maor. Please enjoy. Hi everyone. So thank you for uh, joining our uh, second webinar in uh, the series of what we call the, the state of IoT. As Liran said, uh, we choose the topic now of uh, we choose the topic of uh, uh, eSIM as the topic of today. Uh, we see a lot of traction in the market and some confusion uh, regarding what is an eSIM. Uh, it's funny that uh, some customers still refer to this chip as an eSIM. This is an embedded SIM. Uh, the joke here in, in, in our office is that uh, sometimes we go to, to pay with our credit card in the new machines that are contactless. And the guy in the shop asks us if we have a Wi-Fi on the credit card. So for, for people like us, it's very funny. Wi-Fi cannot uh, be part of, of a credit card uh, chip. And uh, also eSIM, eSIM is, is a, I can tell you a little secret, eSIM can run on any SIM card. eSIM is just a, a, a way of storing the profile and it's got uh, less to do with the form factor of the SIM card. So based on, on uh, some misunderstandings and based on a lot of tractions that uh, we feel and we see in the market, we decided uh, that this topic, uh, that the topic today will be eSIM and we'll talk about, uh, we have a packed agenda uh, to talk about. We want to start the session today with explaining a little bit about SIM card, about how a SIM card works, about the way that operators sell SIM cards. Some operators sell profile, some operators sell a multi imsi So it's a terminology that more MVNO uh, are using. Then we'll switch to eSIM and, and uh, what's in it for me. Who, should, who is using uh, eSIM? Why should I use eSIM? We'll talk a little bit about the demand that there is in the market for eSIM. Then we'll talk a little bit about money, not too much. And towards the end, we want to keep you uh, with us, uh, but we'll talk a little bit about uh, how the economics of, of the eSIM works and uh, who is paying and for what. We will try to touch about uh, some alternative ways to get the same benefits of eSIM without needing to pay the heavy cost uh, that sometimes involved in, in making that solution happen. And eventually uh, we need to, we will love to tell you a little bit about the uh, Monogoto positioning and, and what we do in this market. And, and we leave sometimes for question and answer in the end of the presentation. So we'll start with uh, SIM cards. SIM card subscriber identity model. It's, it's with us, it's I think, one of the best way to keep an identity today. We see a very similar process on credit cards. We see a very similar process on, on passports. And this small plastic card is not really plastic, it's a piece of silicon. It's got multiple different form factor. And as I said in the beginning, on any of them, we can store eSIM and, and we'll talk about it later. The, the old guys ab around us, remember the big uh, size SIM card, on, on machine to machine on IoT, we still use it sometimes. It's called 2FF. The smaller sizes are, are 3FF. iPhone introduced the what we call nano SIM card, meaning to cut all the plastic around it and, and just leave the chip. 
for FF, if, if you want the, the jargon of, of the cellular world. And for companies that want to save space, companies that want to be more efficient in energy, and companies that needs the device to be uh, with less friction, they are using an embedded SIM card. Embedded SIM card, not eSIM, is, is an eight chip. It's got also a six, chip, a six pin or eight pin form factor that you can solder to the board in order for the customers to have the most efficient way of, of having a cellular identity on an IoT device. So that's a SIM card. If we want to deep dive a little bit of, of what's inside the SIM card, uh, what's inside the SIM card in the cellular jargon called profile. A profile is, is a set of parameters. There is a lot of parameters that eventually combine a profile. If the SIM have memory and, and inside the memory of the SIM card, all the parameters are stored. But the main parameters to for, for a SIM cards to operate is first is an IMSI, but, but for people that don't want to get messy with cellular terminology, an IMSI is an identity. It can be an identity of T-Mobile, it can be an identity of AT&T, but ultimately uh, a SIM card is, an IMSI is an identity. This identity is coupled with uh, a key. The key is, what makes the SIM powerful. The key is what makes the SIM very secure. A key is what will allow the SIM eventually to register to a cellular network. The key uh, in, in, the, in the crypto, in the encryption community called symmetrical key, meaning the same key is stored on the SIM card and the same key is installed on the mobile operator. So there is a challenge to make sure that the key is matched when the SIM card try to register. This is why it's, I think, almost impossible to fake identities in, in cellular and much easier to fake identities in, in Wi-Fi and in other uh, last mile technologies. We can see that uh, on a SIM card, there is more than just the key to register to the network. There is another key also known as OTA, over the air key. And the OTA key is, is another set of heavy security if in any case I want to change configuration on the SIM card. So a SIM card is already coming prepared with the mechanism of if in the future somebody will want to, let's say, change the identity. But in order for me to do that, I need a key. Not everybody can send command to the SIM card and this key is also a symmetrical key that the operator is storing. So this key mechanism uh, uh, with the extra parameters such as allowed network or forbidden network, um, eventually combine something that we call a profile. By the way, allowed network, forbidden network, this is great when, when people travel. Uh, I, I think that uh, everybody are back to travel sooner or later. We are traveling next week already. Uh, and, and when you're traveling, you're landing in some place and, and preferred networks will allow you to connect to the operator that is more friendly in the country that you are uh, traveled to. So that's OPLMN or allowed network. And, and on the other side, we have the forbidden network, meaning network that the operator don't want you to, to connect. Eventually, to summarize what's on the SIM card, there is also a number, a number also known as ICCID. <clears throat> it's not inside the SIM card, but it's on the SIM card. And this number allowing the billing mechanism and the, and the CRM to identify the plastic with the digital identity that it is to match it. So that's, that's an ICCID. And this is a profile. This is how operator works for, for the last, I think more than 25 years since GSMA started. And, and operators have profiles. Telefonica, for example, have a profile of Telefonica. This profile of Telefonica combined with key is a, a, of Telefonica is a, is powered by Telefonica and it's only been connected to the Telefonica network. In the Telefonica profile, there will be a KI, a secret, a special key. And this secret will register on Telefonica network. If we'll talk about Singtel INZ or Singtel profile, Singtel profile will have a different identity and it will be able to register on the Singtel network. And this is traditionally how operators work before eSIM and, and still working today. 
you're going to your operator, you're buying a SIM card. It can be a SIM card for IoT, or it can be a SIM card for any other uh, use case, like even normal people. And the SIM card stores some sort of profile in it. The profile identify the keys that you can register in your network. What is a multi imsi A multi imsi is an entity that got evolved uh, with time. Uh, operators that are not uh, limited to one country, operators that need to work in multiple different regions and sometimes have better pricing from one vendor over the other. Those type of operators created a SIM card and uh, the SIM have enough memory to put multiple identity within. So then the SIM cards can store more than one identity and can register with more than one identity to the network. Let's see how it works. On the profile example, I can have a project of 1000 scooters in Telefonica, I don't know, in Madrid. I will put 1000 SIM cards with Telefonica profile on my scooters, inside my scooters. The scooters will register to Telefonica network. The KI, the key will challenge with the Telefonica cloud and they will get internet. They need internet to operate the app. They need internet to work with the backend of the scooter company. And that's how traditionally things are done. Need to remember that when I have a thousand scooters and I want them to connect to my backend, I probably need to set some security policy. I, want, I probably need to set some VPN. And this is all stuff that I need to do with Telefonica network. If later on I want to go and, and have another profile in, in Singapore, so I might go to Singtel, which is a Singaporean operator, get a thousand SIM cards, connect it to a thousand SIM, uh, scooters in Singapore, and now I need to do all the networking configuration and firewall configuration and security policy in Singapore. So when you get profile from each operator, you can work on his network only and you need to make all the configuration in the network to match your backend. What's a multi imsi A multi imsi is a situation that I have a scooter. Maybe I don't know which scooter will go to Madrid and which scooter will go to Singapore. Maybe the 1000 scooters that are going to Madrid will go on MNO that is in Madrid. The 1000 scooters that go to Singapore will go to MNO that's in Singapore. But what's nice in multi imsi is that they can all pass to an operator that can host both identities. And then from there, they can get connected to the internet. One place to get connected to the internet, one place to deploy security policy, and one place to do all the configuration. So that has, that's how it works. So what's an eSIM? And why should I have an eSIM? And, and who decided that there will be an eSIM? So the eSIM drive or the main drive of eSIM come from GSMA. GSMA is the uh, organization that uh, organized, organized that combined all the cellular operators in the world. The GSMA created a situation that all the, all the operators pay subscription and based on this subscription, ba based on this subscription, one second, guys, we have some echo. I want to, to fix it. One second, guys, I'm sorry. Sorry, they told me that we have some echo problems. I hope it's better now. So basically the GSMA is standardized uh, a way for uh, electronic or um, embedded SIM to work. And the main drive is actually there are two main drives. There is one main drive that, that uh, everybody see on the consumer side. Today, somebody lands in, in a foreign country. He don't need to buy a SIM card. He can scan a QR code. And based on this QR code, he can get a SIM card for his time that he is in London or his time that he is traveling. This is a consumer eSIM. Today, I can call my operator. And if I want to port myself from one operator to the other, I don't need to go to the shop to, to get a SIM card. I can get it 
on a digital way. And this is a consumerism. We are not going to talk to their consumerism, but that's one drive to create this type of technology. The other drive is M2M. It's funny that they still call it M2M, but M2M changed to IoT a long time ago. But the M2M machine to machine, IoT Internet of Things, this is evolvement of, of the machine to machine in, in, from the history. But an M2M eSIM is, is what we'll talk about today. And an M2M eSIM is the ability for a company to deploy 1,000 scooters in Madrid and remotely tell the SIM cards to switch to Telefonica, for example. And this capability needs to be standardized because I want the, sc the scooters to be completely independent moving from one operator to another. So this is how eSIM uh, came to life. In other places, it's called EUICC. So if you want to sound more, uh, uh, I don't want to say old fashioned, I want to say more uh, educated on the cellular world, you will say EUICC, but eSIM is good enough. And it's the ability for me to control the identity that is within the scooter, but not the IMSI, the full profile. And what make it an eSIM, it, it's a combination. First, I need to be able to change the configuration of the scooter. But second, this is, needs to come from a trusted place. GSMA created a certification for eSIM. For you or for a company to be certified in eSIM, first, they need to, to know a lot about security and about how to handle keys. Second, they need a very ultra super secure storage to, to store the keys. It cannot be on www.smdrdp.com. It needs to be in a, in a very secure without a place without access to the internet. And, and this platform is licensed and gets certificated by the GSMA. This platform with all the certification, give operator the, the confidence to store the profiles over there. And with this confidence, you can have theoretically, and, and we'll say soon why theoretically, but you can have a situation that multiple different operators have the same place to store profile and uh, the scooter company can pick and choose which operators they want the, the scooter to work on. And it, it sounds great but it's only sound great and we'll touch soon why, why we have some difficulties around it. But with, before we'll, we'll dive into it, let's see who is the ideal customer and who is, who is driving it and on, on the M2M side and who is using it. So imagine yourself as a, a company that makes smart lights and deploying a hundred of thousands of smart lights and, and as we as you probably know, most of the smart lights that is deployed now is deployed with cellular connectivity, Wi-Fi and mesh and, and all kinds of open, open radio protocols are not solid enough and, and cellular is affordable. But if I'm already climbing and changing the lamp and putting a new, a new sensor over there, I don't want to do it ever again. Maybe not ever, maybe in the next 10 years. So I need to find a solution that I will be able to trust and I will be able to, to know that will stay there in the next 10 years. And then maybe uh, some commercial will change and I would want to change an operator after five years. Let's say it's a car company and the car company ship cars now. The car company don't want to have different assembly line and put different SIM cards depending where the car is going to end up. Car company wants to have one assembly line, put the SIM card, inside the car. And, and if I find, uh, if I got 1000 uh, cars in, in the UK, I need to be able to program the cars to a UK profile, to a UK operator. So this is two examples. Uh, we have many more of why companies are future proofing themselves and already putting eSIM in solutions that they know that needs to last for many years. And in an, uh, ideal world, what's happened here? Somebody hack into my presentation. That's crazy. In an ideal world, I have one platform that hosts all the service provider profile. And this platform that hosts all the service provider profiles uh, allow me to 
have a project with, I don't know, 1,000 scooters. I, I stuck with the 1,000 scooters on today's example. 1,000 scooters on, on Vodafone network. And then maybe the scooters end up in Madrid and I want to move them to Telefonica network. No problem. I'm sending a command to the scooter. The scooter wakes up and downloading the new profile. The new profile will be Telefonica profile. The scooter uh, on the next time it registered to the network will register to Telefonica network. In an ideal world, this, this works fine. And I should be able to switch between Vodafone, Singtel, Telefonica. There are maybe more than 900 different providers, maybe more than a few hundred MNOs, and I should be able to play and move between profiles. But as we will see soon, it's not so simple and, and things get complicated when we look at a real life example, and I will explain uh, later on why. But before we'll, we'll dive into the why and uh, we'll dive into the uh, how things get complicated, we want to touch a little bit about what do we see uh, that happen in the market. And, and it's very interesting to see where the drive is coming from. Uh, some companies, mostly big companies, understand that, that they are deploying a scooter, taxis, point of sales, lamps, they are deploying millions of devices. And in the strategy, when they start to deploy those millions of devices, they understand that they want more control. And, and their way to get more control is to get an SM, to get a subscription management of, of themselves. So those companies are not coming to the operators. Those companies are going to the SIM manufacturer, to the EU ICC platform, like GND, like Idemia, like Works, and they are purchasing an SM, a license, a, a tenant. After they are purchasing the tenant, they are going to the operator and they only ask the operator if the operator is willing to give them a profile. And this is an easy task because they got a platform. The platform is uh, GSMA accredited. So it's a trusted platform that the operator are more than happy to, to sell SIM cards through that platform. And, and that's what they are doing. Unfortunately, this is a play that, that the big players can do it, but small companies that are growing cannot afford going and purchasing an SM and, and maintaining it. You need to learn cellular, you need to know cellular, and you need to have the capacity also to, to pay for such platform. So the other trend that we see in the market of, of companies that want to future-proof themselves is companies that are taking eSIM as a service. And then they can start with 1,000 eSIMs, they can start with a, a 100 eSIMs, and they don't need to learn how to operate those platforms and they can get it uh, with API on a consumption base. But we do see companies that a second before making the decision of, of buying 10, 20,000 SIM cards are, are uh, thinking twice if to take a regular SIM card or to take eSIM or EYCC. And, and of course, there are some uh, financial implications and, and we'll talk about it uh, later in the presentation. So before we talk about uh, money and, and how much this type of solution costs, let's, let's understand a little bit why it's not uh, as good as, as it sounds. And, and the reason is that the ecosystem is, is very fragmented. There are uh, I think dozens, even more of companies that are able to provide eSIM. Uh, you have the incumbent, the tier one, the, the companies that are selling SIM card from the uh, first Nokia phone that, uh, or, or Motorola phone that was on, on GSMA. And those companies are, are started with uh, plastic SIM card, moved to embedded SIM card, and now they're on eSIM, GND, uh, Jamalto, which is TELUS today, and Idemia, big companies, and, and they are, they are the, the main provider. Then you have the tier two, it's companies that have different approach to the market, but, but also traditionally are seen vendors and also their purchase license become accredited and they are providing a eSIM solution. And then you have all the new players. The new players is companies that are building vertical solutions. 
companies like Truefond that sell the connectivity and the eSIM, companies like ConnectedU that are sourcing multiple different eSIM for multiple different operators. So we have all kinds of new players that are, are doing a vertical approach and, and also selling eSIM as part of the vertical approach that, that they have. And the problem is that in the ideal world, I want to be able to move from any operator to any, from any between operators. But the world is not ideal. And now we have a situation that Idemia have a platform that is serving few operators. And Vox might have a platform. This is not real example, guys. This is just a, a, a statement of how the world look like. And Vox, which is another thing I know, might have a platform that will serve few other operators. And GND, another vendor, will have a platform that will serve other operators. Yes, in the protocol, there is a way to interconnect the platform, but this way is, is uh, expensive. And, and to tell big company A that they need to get interconnect to a very big company B, usually involves six, eight, nine months and hundreds of thousands of dollars. And, and until all platform will be interconnected between themselves, there is no easy way to switch from Vodafone to Telefonica or from Vodafone to Singtel or any operator that wants to, to have a easy, any, sorry, any use case that wants to switch profile in an easy way. So what we understand today that if a scooter company wants to future-proof itself and, and decide that they want to work in Vodafone, Singtel and Telefonica in the next five, 10 years, they need to choose an eSIM vendor that will be able to host all these profile on the same place. Because thinking about integration between two vendors already make it complicate and, and friction and less feasible. And, and that's that's big part of the reason we think sometimes this solution can get complicated and more painful. Let's talk about money. Uh, we'll start by explaining that these solutions cost more than the traditional SIM card. So the physical hardware of an eSIM is more complicated. There are more certificates on it. There is, it's more heavy on the computing side and it costs more. So if you used to pay half a dollar per SIM card, now you will pay 80 cents per SIM card. The actual a process of making the hardware is, is more expensive. But that's not only that. The, this platform is hosted in, in a colocation that is highly secured, highly regulated, a high availability, of course, and these things cost money. So on top of the SIM cards that you use to buy and, and that's it, you just buy SIM cards and, and you forget, now you need to add subscription. So if I'm deploying a camera, a, a smart light, and these smart lights need to work for 10 years, I need to understand that I'm adding 20 cents per year, sometimes $1 per year for the subscription. And, and on, on many years, it's starting to become heavy on, on the project cost and sometimes it cannot justify. And, and the last thing is that in many cases, it's also involved setup fee. Uh, an operator, not all operators are flexible and if, you have a project of, I don't know, 1,000 SIM cards, and you will go to an operator and tell him I need the eSIM. I, I'm maybe the smaller player or the, the players that are more agile will be able to deliver this 1,000 profile, but the big players will probably want large commitments or big setup fee to make such a project happen. So this is, uh, evolvement in the market because we see that eSIM have some significance. We see that companies that are going to RFPs of many years or companies that deploy solutions that needs to roam between networks um, have the need of, of future proofing themselves, have the need to, to sleep quietly without the worry of, of needing to climb a lamp to, to change SIM cards in, in case of commercial uh, uh, dispute or in case of uh, making a, a decision to change. 
and and uh, we are uh, we see all kind of movement maybe a customer can ask the operator for the keys of the simple so in case of a problem he can switch to another vendor maybe the mno can have another mno a uh, promise so two mnos can decide that they will back each other up on a project maybe customer can get an an ota so a, a way to change the identity on the sim card himself because eventually the customer purchases a sim card and, and if he make a decision that he wants to switch it to another operator maybe uh, the operator should give him the entitlement to do it as long as he moves the sim card from from his network so eSIM is not a mandatory way to change the identity. We can see that there are proprietary ways to, to do it. And we see some movement in, in creating proprietary ways to do it. I wouldn't call it eSIM. I would call it a programmable SIM. I would call it API to change setting on the SIM card. But I would love to save the, the word eSIM and EUICC for the traditional way of, of doing things. Um, We'll, we'll end up the presentation with a little bit about uh, Monogoto and about our uh, positioning here. So Monogoto is an over-the-top uh, MVNO and we try to be agnostic on, on any layer of the solution that we give. So we are not limiting us, ourselves to work with a single MNO. We are okay to work with multiple animal, MNOs. We are not limiting ourselves to a single SIM vendor. And by the way, we also work on private 5G or private network that, that also can consider themselves as the MNOs of the future. And on the same DNA, we are uh, happy to work with any subscription management. So we are happy to sell a few hundred SIM cards with subscription management that is one of our value added services, not powered by us because we are not GSMA uh, accredited and that's not our strategy but we are happy to sell this type of SIM card and we are happy also to host a, a profile from another network on, on our uh, cloud. So we are trying to stay an agnostic cloud because we think that eventually all the operators main agenda is that more and more use cases of IOT will move to cellular. We know that IOT uh, are, have almost a limited amount of SIM cards or potential customer or potential SIM card, uh, no, no really uh, glass ceiling. And uh, to drive more and more uh, connectivity to this industry, industry, you need to be able to be agile and, and to uh, allow customer to grow in platform. So this is our position. I want to thank you everybody for listening. We we'll leave time now for, for questions and answer and we'll wrap it up. I pass the mic to Liran. Hi, so we do have a question here. Do you support consumer eSIM? That's okay. So the, the answer is yes, of course, we support consumer eSIM. We are a network and as I said, we are agnostic, but uh, this was not the focus on the presentation. We love to take it offline and explain how we can deliver also consumer eSIM. Okay, we have many questions. So one of them is, we have regular SIMs. Can they support eSIM? So here the immediate answer is no. Uh, the hardware of the eSIM is, is different than the hardware of the regular SIM card. The software inside is different. Uh, you need to purchase new SIM card. You cannot convert a SIM uh, to become an eSIM. Okay, another question is, we have an IoT sensor with your SIM and the next generation of the hardware will be eSIM. What should we do? The IoT sensor is with our SIM now. We are very happy about that. Uh, the next generation needs to get an EUICC. And here you have two options. One option is, depend how many devices in the next generation, but one option is to go to a SIM vendor let's say works as an SM and, and buy the SIM card from him and we will donate the profile. And the other way is to get the profile from us that are EUICC, that are eSIM enabled. Okay, another question is, what is iSIM? Does it work with eSIM? 
Ah, that's that's a nice one. Uh, iSIM is integrated SIM. Uh, I can consider iSIM to be the next generation of eSIM. So if an eSIM was um, a small form factor, uh, if an eSIM was a small form factor that I, I had to solder to the SIM, or an eSIM was a, a physical plastic uh, that I had to put inside a, a device, an iSIM is an integrated SIM. It's a piece of software that is running virtually on the IoT device and can emulate uh, the SIM. Okay, another question is how long does it take to have, how long, right, does it take to have eSIM profiles? Uh, again, here it's de depend uh, from who. So two, two ways to get it. One way is to get uh, eSIM profile from a SIM vendor, let's say GND, and then you need to create a relationship with GND. You need to, to subscribe to their uh, subscription management, SM, and then according to their delivery time, uh, assuming there are no cheap shortage, uh, I guess a few months. The other way is to, to come to operator like us that already have a stock of, of easing and, and value added service. And then with uh, somebody like us, it can be an immediate uh, delivery of few weeks depending on the stock. Okay, and the last question, can I have a hybrid solution, partially regular SIMs and partially eSIMs? Yes, that's uh, completely agnostic. Pa part of the platform is the uh, regular SIM, part of the platform is, is eSIM, that's, that's not a problem. Eventually the eSIM and regular SIM is just the same way to eventually access uh, my network or somebody's network. Okay, another question. If we buy your eSIM, how can we load profile from another connectivity provider? Okay, so, so let's look at this situation. Somebody is getting an eSIM powered by, it's not powered by Monogoto, but it's true Monogoto uh, value added service, uh, one of our partners. This eSIM will probably have a bootstrap powered by Monogoto. So this SIM can uh, uh, wake up literally in any country in the world and say, I'm here. If you're sending command of the other profile and we can, we can issue the command and changing uh, the identity. But as, but, as I, but as I mentioned in the, in the lecture, you need to be able to, this profile will be also hosted on the same uh, vendor of eSIM that we are using. Because we are agnostic to the same vendor, we are okay to integrate to more vendors. So more likely what will happen, it's either we will integrate to your eSIM vendor and we'll put our profiles over there also, or you will give us your profile to, uh, depending if it's a friendly operator, to donate it to our uh, eSIM uh, partner. I hope that this was clear. Great. Uh, another question is, do you provide SM as a service? So we do not provide the SM as a service, but we have a partner that provides the SM as a service and we can sub provide it. So we will be the channel for the money. We will be the channel for the service, but the actual storage of the profile will be on a certified accredited SM. Another question, would I not be locked to Monogoto versus being locked into a tier one MNO versus uh, slash uh, SIM manufacturer. So we have a, a strategy of completely not locked. Not locked if you have an eSIM and not locked if you have a physical SIM. So that's in, it's our strategy. Will I not be locked to Monogoto? So I can say fully, we're fully confident we are not locking any, any, any customer. We, we are completely open about it. Other operators are locking. So, so that depends now who is starting. And a SIM manufacturer, if you are getting a SIM manufacturer with an eSIM on it, uh, we will be very happy to provide a bootstrap and then you are safe through, throughout the life of the device. Okay, we have a lot of questions from the audience. We'll try to answer as much as possible. Another question is what will be the pricing model um, as many of the IoT products range from very cheap to industry grade. 
So the, the cost is involved. The industry, industrial grade uh, or chip is between a plastic and a, in a like high temperature, high resistant uh, silicon. And, and the same difference on, on the physical SIM uh, happen on the, on the eSIM. So only the eSIM add like, I guess 20, 30% more to the price of SIM card. So if today an average price of a, um, automotive SIM card, which is the highest grade of, of SIM cards that we are selling today is, is around the, uh, a dollar for assuming, I don't remember the price, an eSIM with the same capabilities will cost a, a dollar and, and something. So you add money because it's an eSIM, but you can get all the grades. Okay, so how does the operator connect to the eSIM service provider? How does the operator connect to the eSIM? So operator choose an eSIM provider and operator after he makes the decision who is his eSIM provider, having some sort of of a way to pass profile between the eSIM to the operator network. This way usually is a secure over SFTP with encryption key. So there are 100% certainty that the keys that pass from the operator to the service, SIM service provider are highly secure. Okay, great. So we have many questions. Unfortunately, we can't answer everyone. So uh, we can answer you offline. I wanna thank everyone for participating in this session about eSIM as part of the State of IoT Connectivity webinar series. And thank you, Maor. I hope you enjoyed it and that you find this session informative. We would like to get your feedback. If you have any thoughts, any ideas, any questions, please contact us in the email listed uh, below on the last slide. Um, and make sure to visit our website Please also follow our LinkedIn page to get the latest updates from Monogoto. Thank you again, guys, and we hope to see you in the next webinar. Thank you very much, everyone.